Ultimatum is the nothing personal word of the day for Tuesday, August 9th, 2022. Ultimatum, we all use that word, but let's get the exact definition so we can put this in perspective. An ultimatum is a final demand or statement of terms. A final demand or a statement of terms, the rejection of which will result in retaliation or a breakdown in relations. Kevin Durant issued an ultimatum to the owner of the Brooklyn Nets in a recent meeting in London between the two men. We've heard and talked about Joseph Tsai, plenty the owner of the Nets. We've heard and talked about Kevin Durant, the petulant child in year one of a $198 million four-year contract. It hasn't even started yet. And Kevin Durant went in and demanded a trade, go back to previous episodes of Nothing Personal, and I gave you my opinion of a player walking in and demanding a trade. Horse hockey. Get back to the dugout. Get into the clubhouse. Put on your uniform and your jockstrap and go win a game. Kevin Durant tripled down. Met with Joseph Tsai in London and said, listen, I've got a plan. That's how this meeting goes. If I'm Joe and I get a call from Kevin saying, hey, I want to meet, that's fine. Go full Dan Snyder. You want to subpoena me, meet me? You better come onto my yacht. Come to where I am. I'll let you know when I'm free. I'll be in London and you can meet me for 12 minutes in the lobby bar of the Bristol. Kevin Durant walks in, sits with Joe, talks about his situation, wonders why he hasn't been traded yet, and says to him, you know, either trade me because my trade demand stands, or I have an alternative. And Joe said, this is great. What? Do you want to maybe change the uniform? Do you want a different set of cheerleaders? Are you hoping for a different road hotel when we play the Lakers or the Warriors? I'm happy to talk about any of that. Oh, you want different food on the team plane? Interesting, I like it. You want to leave before a city a day early, a day late? All the different things with travel that players care about and talk to us about. Different things in the clubhouse. Do you want a hyperbaric chamber? All the other crap. All right, I'm ready to listen. What else? What, what do you got, Kevin? All right, Joe, here it is. Either you trade me or you get rid of the coach and the GM. In my entire career, and you know how long it was, 18 freaking years, if I ever had a player come up to me and say, listen, I'm really happy to be here but I'm not going to play for this manager or this GM. I would have fired the manager. <laughs> Just kidding. We fire the managers on our own when we decide. If I think Steve Nash isn't working out, I'll fire him. I'm not doing it because Kevin Durant wants me to. If I think Sean Marks, who's a holdover from Mikhail Baryshnikov's era, then I'm not going to fire him just because Kevin Durant said so. But in the meeting, when Kevin Durant says that, what do you think Joe was doing or thinking? I want to give you a play-by-play -play of how it works, of what the mentality is, because Joseph's a smart man. He was picturing his Technicolor dream coat that he was going to put on after the meeting. He was going to walk back to his hotel. He was going to get into the room. He was going to pick up the phone. He was going to call his PR person. He's going to say, listen, I just had a meeting with KD. KD wants me to do something I'm not going to do. We need to get the word out because KD is going to look horrific. It's not going to change anything related to trading him or not trading him, but we've got to get ahead of this because we're going to leak it. So the Nets leaked about this meeting, leaked what Kevin Durant demanded, his ultimatum. By the way, on a side note, What's your strategy with ultimatums? Can we take a minute on this, the concept of ultimatums in all of our lives? Most of us don't go to a owner of, of our team or owner of our company and issue an ultimatum. But when do you pull the ultimatum card? As a parent, as a child, as a friend? The ride or die friend, we hear that expression a lot. That's someone who's gonna be with you no matter what. Leave no man behind. 
don't you do that. If you do that, then I'll do this. Is that an ultimatum? When you say to your kids, if you don't eat your vegetables, then you will not have dessert. Really what you're doing is putting the decision about whether or not to eat the vegetables in the hands of the child. You're not making the kid eat the vegetables. There's a consequence to not eating the vegetables. You don't get the dessert. The thing about an ultimatum is that if you misplay it, you've got to follow through on it. It's the same concept as when you tell a player, we're not giving you the fifth year, and then you do. We're not settling your arbitration case, and then you do. You tell your child that you're not going to allow dessert if they don't eat their vegetables, they don't eat their vegetables, and you bring out the hostess cupcake. What does that tell your child? I just got to hold out. I got to stick it out and I'm going to get the cupcake or the ding dong or the ring ding or even, heaven forbid, the ho ho. Players are grown up children. If you promise you are going to do something and you don't do it, you might as well not have promised. But if you issue an ultimatum as a player, you better have an end game. So let's discuss what Kevin Durant controls. Let me think about it. Hold on, I'll be right with you. Give me a minute. I'm still thinking. What does Kevin Durant control? The uniform logo. No, 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 no. What seat he sits on on the team plane? Maybe. Most experienced guy on the team. There's generally a hierarchy on the team plane. You get to choose your seat. All right, he can control that. Who his teammates are? Hmm. Maybe with player empowerment, he could get a trade. He could get a signing. He could do a LeBron and get a friend of his to come to Brooklyn. Maybe. All right, that's a good one. Who the coach is? Hmm. No. Who the general manager is? Definitely no. Oh, my God. I got it. The ultimatum of either me or them, if it's them and he's not traded, wait for it, he cannot play. That's it. When Kevin Durant gave the ultimatum to Joseph Tsai and said, either trade me or get rid of your coach and GM, Joseph Tsai looked at him and said, or what? And Kevin Durant said, I'm not going to play. And Joseph Sy said, wait a minute, let me get this straight. All I have to do is keep Steve Nash and Sean Marks, not trade you, and you won't play, and therefore I won't pay you? You're going to give up 40 to $50 million if we don't trade you. It's an ultimatum, Joe. Let's review. In the meeting, they said this. Let's review. Are you sure that this is the hill you want to die on? We're not trading you for below value. We're not changing course in our front office if we don't choose to. So why are we meeting? Why are you so frustrated? Because James Harden wasn't a good teammate who you wanted on the team? Because Ben Simmons won't play game four in a sweep situation. He had chronic back. Can't shoot. No offense. You've got the offense. More shots for you. Oh, you're upset because your friend Kyrie Irving wouldn't get vaccinated. Everything you're upset about that happened to our team was self-inflicted. And you were a part of it. But, but Joe, I couldn't tell Kyrie to get vaccinated. Well, we sure as hell couldn't. The best chance of him playing last year was you stepping in. By the way, you also got all this money while you were hurt, but I digress because you've come back really well and you're still an MVP caliber player. But we've proven that you can't do it alone. That meeting is one of the most frustrating meetings I've ever seen made public. It required the Nets to do two things, and they did. It required them to leak 
the meeting. And then it required Joseph Tsai to go public with his plan. Joseph Tsai is a businessman, very wealthy. You know that. What did he start? It was, uh, oh God, it was that uh, business, Alibaba. Thank you, Coca. Coca's on it. Alibaba. Let's say he's worth $1 billion, $10 billion, $20 billion. He's just worth more than Kevin Durant. He's way smarter than Kevin Durant. One of the things that I wanted to make clear to our players, and this is going to sound controversial, but understand the context. We have the advantage in every single meeting we have with players because it's what we do. The players have the advantage in every single on-court activity or on-field activity. Everything that an athlete needs or wants to succeed on the field, they have the advantage because they've done it. But when it comes to business, you're not going to outsmart us. Therefore, you get an agent. Now, if the agent is a good agent, they will be able to tell the player when you can push and when you can't. You do not do an ultimatum without a plan. So Joseph Tsai goes on Twitter and says something very, very simple. Our front office and coaching staff have my support. We will make decisions in the best interest of the Brooklyn Nets. Love, Joseph. I would prefer he not tweet. Reminded Coke of Stephen Cohn, as he should have. There's no reason for him to tweet it. He could have made a statement. He could have delivered a statement. What that statement means is that Kevin Durant and his position and his ultimatum have zero credibility and zero impact on their plan. That's what he wants you to believe. As president of the Nets, what I would want is to let Kevin Durant rot. I would have him, along with crap players, win 20 games for the next four years, let him collect his money, play him 45 minutes a game, and that's it. No more rings. No more nothing. You wanted the money. You wanted Brooklyn. You created this mess. Now you're going to live in it. The problem is owners are not willing to throw away a year to say nothing of four to prove a point to a player. It's why more often than not, when players make demands, the demands are met. It's, and I don't remember we talked yesterday about Kareem Hunt. I'm not talking about the Kareem Hunts of the world. I'm talking about impact players making trade demands. What's worse for a game than having a player sign long-term with a team and then wanting a trade before that contract even starts? Adam Silver, the commissioner of basketball, is aware of how embarrassing it is. He's aware of how bad it is for fans. He understands that Brooklyn Nets fans are DBR right now. They had an opportunity for dynasty, they thought, and now they have an opportunity for lottery. But Joseph Tsai and every other owner out there is not going to throw away even a minute. Which is why, no matter what Tsai tweeted... The only way this Durant situation ends, the only way the Nets can start to get healthy is by trading Kevin Durant. The Brooklyn Nets will trade Kevin Durant. They will keep Steve Nash. They will keep Sean Marks. They will choose their front office. They will say to their players, do not make me ultimatums. But they will satisfy the Durant ultimatum. That's the irony. Out of one side of their mouths, management will say, you are not empowered, you are not in control. On the other side of their mouth, they will show otherwise. Show me, don't tell me. Actions speak louder than words. One of the biggest difficulties in running a team is knowing that actions speak louder than words, knowing that you're gonna use words out there in public, out there with the media, out there with your leaks, but at the end of the day, Smart players know that whatever is said publicly may be totally different than what's happening internally. And when Kevin Durant gets traded, how does that work for the other superstars in the NBA when they see that ultimatums do work, that he got his way? 
it sickens me that Kevin Durant is going to get his way. But there is no other choice for that organization. None. Wait to see. Kevin Durant is getting traded. I assume he'll go to Boston. The Jalen Brown package seems to be the best package out there. He has no say where he goes. The money works. The trade works. It makes Boston better. I'm not sure it makes the Nets better. Can you imagine if the Nets are forced into trading Durant and they simply get even worse? A team with Irving and Simmons and no other leader? Oy vey. All right, Coca. That's it for Durant. I can't give you any more. It's too frustrating. Ultimatum was our word of the day. I'll give you an ultimatum. Coca, play me some music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson? Get into my Twitter at David P. Samson. Ask me a question, and I may answer. And you don't even have to be half-baked. Hello, David. Hello. What is your view of the catcher interference rule? I got about 12 questions on this. I'm not convinced that any of the 12 people who asked this exact question are aware of my relationship to the catcher, catcher interference rule. I bring you back to 2011 in Major League Baseball. I'm in San Francisco in an extra inning game. We have a player, it's the Marlins against the Giants. We've got a player named Scott Cousins. We're in extra innings. I believe, Coca, that we had come back to tie the game. I don't think we blew the save. I think they blew the save to bring it to extra innings. But I can't remember that part of it. But what happened next, I shall never forget. There's a single. Scott Cousins is coming in. Buster Posey's catching. There's a play at the plate. And Scott Cousins barrels into Buster Posey in a way that makes Pete Rhodes look like a wussy. Scott Cousins stands up. He's safe. We score a run. He's bleeding. And Buster Posey's not moving. The crowd is going crazy because Buster Posey at that time, they were in the middle of their 10, 12, 14 World Series championship run. It was the makings of a dynasty. This was the year they didn't make it to a World Series or win the World Series. But they were a very, very good team. The game ends. Scott Cousins is in the clubhouse. And we're talking. The team is talking. And the Giants owners and management and GM and manager were furious. There was Sports Center. Every highlight show was leading with this play. Buster Posey, MVP, star of the league, knocked out by scrub Scott Cousins. What kind of dirty player is Scott Cousins? He's not dirty in the least. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. You think Scott Cousins is trying to hurt Buster Posey? That play crushed Scott Cousins. That play impacted his career. Buster Posey's out, and all of a sudden, we go to an owner's meeting, and owners start talking about how important it is that that never happens again. Their point was that when we've got a good player, we've got to keep that player on the field. We do not want to pay players not to play. We've got to stop injuries. It's hard enough and bad enough with the injuries that we can't control, but self-inflicted injuries, we've got to get rid of. We cannot have collisions at the plate. This was not done because we were interested in the health of the catcher, didn't want catchers to get concussions, wanted to make sure they could add two plus two when they were 69 years old. That was not at all what we were thinking. That's not what we said to you publicly when the rule came out that we're interested in the safety of our players, like the NFL is interested in the safety of their players with CTE, GMAB. This was owners saying we are sick and tired of paying players on the DL. It was called the disabled list back then. So the Buster Posey rule gets passed. It gets written and sent to the clubs. We looked at it and said, what the hell is this? How are umpires going to call this rule? It's impossible. 
Catchers have to give a lane to the runner to score at the plate, except if the flight of the ball brings the catcher into the line of the runner. Huh? We would teach our catchers and our outfielders to throw into the line of the runner. You don't want the run to score. The best way for a run not to score is to block the plate. The best way to block the plate is to do exactly what Gary Sanchez of the Twins did. It's to put your knee down and make it impossible for the runner to score. Have you ever watched a second baseman apply a tag to a man stealing second? You are taught to catch the ball on the bounce or the fly, depending on who's throwing it from the catcher, and you put your inside knee, your left knee down, parallel to second base. That's why we teach players, don't slide head first. You're gonna break your finger either on the base itself or on the player's leg. We prefer you to slide feet first. And if you slide head first, and we'd like to have you wear mittens because we don't want you to get hurt. Are you getting the theme? We don't want our players hurt, but we want to score. Every single year since 2011, there have been complaints made to whether it was Joe Torrey or Mike Hill or Commissioner Seliger Manford that the rule, the catcher interference rule, was not being applied equally. Instant replay was not changing that fact. And we didn't know what to expect from one game to the next, and you can't run a league like that. And we were told time and time again that once this rule has now been put in place, and it's been around for 10 years, once this rule has been put in place, we cannot go backwards. We have told everyone we're about the safety of the catcher and the safety of our players. We cannot allow for those types of collisions to take place. Owners said, we don't want the collisions, we don't want the players to be injured, but we need clarity of the rule. There are people who are really smart in the commissioner's office who write rules. So we'll agree on a rule, you'll have a rules committee and a competition committee, but it actually has to be written down and put in a rule book. Have you ever read the rule book and seen how they describe, how the rule book describes certain of these rules? You have to go through every possible scenario. You have to describe it so that umpires and team officials and players understand what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. The catcher interference rule is the most confusing, ineffective rule in baseball. That's slight hyperbole. It is among the most confusing and ineffective rules in baseball. My view of it from the beginning has been the same, which is it should not have been instituted. And if it had not been Buster Posey and it had been a backup catcher or a Marlins catcher, which was one of my big arguments, if that were our guy, if that were Ramon Castro or Mike Redmond getting clocked by, by one of the Giants players, we're not having this conversation. But we got to protect Buster Posey. It made us so angry as other teams that good old Buster got hurt by Scott Cousins creating this unbelievable tale, T-A-I-L and T-A-L-E. The tale is what's happened for the last 11 years. The T-A-L-E is the story of the day where Scott Cousins was after Buster Posey and it was career ending, which it wasn't. Not even close, ridiculous. When rules are made with the intent of safety, when rules are made with the intent of changing the game, you better get it right or you're going to have unintended consequences. Major League Baseball is the worst league of all of them in rule changes. Everyone gets crazy. Everyone talks about, I'm a traditionalist, don't do this, don't do that. Meanwhile, the NFL and NBA change the rules all the time. The NFL came out yesterday with a rule change, a rule clarification, and this one made me smile. Get ready, NFL fans. You are going to see more yellow this season on the field than in the collective stadium urinal. Every play is going to be a yellow flag. 
the NFL has announced that they're going to enforce very strictly the illegal contact rule. Let me rewind if you don't know what that is. Do you know that as a defensive player, you're not really allowed to touch the offensive player after five yards from the line of scrimmage? So if the ball is on the 30-yard line, from the 30 to the 35, you can beat the crap out of the offensive player. You can put your hands in his throat, your fingers in his eye. You can grab his cup and squeeze. Do whatever you want. At the 36-yard line, hands off, baby, hands off. And if you touch the player, the yellow flag comes out five yards. That's no big deal. Wait for it. Automatic first down. Third and 20. Ah, oh, Christ, I touched the player after 6.2 yards. That's five yards. They're not in field goal range. Uh-oh, first down. The penalty for legal contact of five yards is reasonable. The automatic first down is not reasonable. It should be five yards, replay the down. When the NFL made this decision that they're going to enforce illegal contact, they have changed the game. They are going to make defenders go hands off because they want more scoring, more scoring. Ratings are great, not when the final score is 3-2 to two or 10-7. to seven. We want 55-41. to 41. We want the over to hit way more than the under. Why? Why do you think that the NFL wants offense? What are you focused on every day when you're doing your fantasy? What gets you points? other than you have got one defense that plays, but what gets you your real points? You need scoring. What about the Red Zone channel? How much money is, oh God, they're selling the Red Zone channel. They're gonna get billions of dollars in revenue. Tons of people are bidding on it. And the NFL gets to say, we're gonna have Red Zones galore. You're not gonna be able to keep it straight. Every game, someone's gonna be in the Red Zone every minute. We're gonna change the rules so that it is nothing but a red zone fantasy. There is a reason why the NFL does what it does. And it is totally manipulative because it's the game that they think you wanna see. So I ask you, do you want the flag every play? Do you wanna make it so being a cornerback, which is the hardest position already on the field, becomes even harder? Is that what excites you? If you're saying yes to this, you're in. Now you'll get a little choppiness in the game. There'll be a bunch of first downs, but it doesn't matter. A bunch of flags, a bunch of referees turning on their microphone. Illegal contact downfield, number 25, defense. Five yards, automatic, first down. NFL's not stupid, you know that. Okay. Ooh, when we come back, we're going to review a movie that I was asked to watch by a very good friend. And I had never heard of it, which is amazing because I'd been gone a month, I guess. And it is a movie that is now um, in the top two that I've seen this entire year. And then we're going to talk about what's going on in Chicago because it's quite something. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. How are you? Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing, all the things that you do for nothing personal, telling your friends about it. We survived 27 days away, 17 days of shows that could have been dark. But no, we had 10 mailbag episodes that you all liked. Thank you very much. By the way, we'll do another mailbag episode. I keep getting more questions. Go on Apple and you're supposed to review and rate and subscribe. You can ask questions in that review. You can go on Twitter and ask me questions. Just get people to follow. For whatever reason, the followers you get that you don't buy, because I refuse to buy followers on Twitter, the followers you get, it shows that people are listening or paying attention. I have no idea. So I still watch a movie every day. And I got to tell you the movie that I watched. But I want to do it like this. See if you can hear this. Cha-cha, real smooth. Turn it out. Have you ever done the cha-cha slide? Cha-cha, real smooth. I never knew that was part of the words. When I saw there was a movie called Cha-cha, real smooth, I had no idea, none, what it meant, what it was. 
Then during the course of the movie, they're doing the cha-cha slide and they're playing the song cha-cha slide, which I've done to the left, right? You get a few drinks, you take a toke, whatever you're doing at a bar mitzvah or a wedding and you walk inside, they're doing line dances. There's nothing better than seeing 150 five foot five Jewish guys doing the cha-cha smooth to the left, to the right, right? Everything's looking great. And then I hear it, cha-cha real smooth. Never knew that was a line. So I'm told to watch the movie and I'm told by my friend Jacqueline, who when she says, watch a movie, I'm gonna watch a movie. She knows I'm a movie connoisseur, knows I review a movie. If she's giving me a rec, I'm taking it. You know I don't read reviews, didn't look at the trailer, had never heard of Cooper Rafe ever, don't know how, 25 years old. He wrote it, he produced it, he directed it. I have never seen Shithouse Coca. I'm watching that today, I think. We didn't review Shithouse. If I saw Shithouse, then we are gonna have to redo this entire thing. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to my list, Coca. You can keep this in the show, you cannot. I search and I can tell you I have not seen, I keep a list of, oh my God, I reviewed Shithouse. There's no pot, Coca went. Oh my God. In November of 2020, I reviewed Shithouse. Did I like it? I need a minute. I need a minute. All right, we'll, we'll go back to the show in one second. I, I, this is a very bad moment right now. I'm feeling quite old and annoyed that I would not know or remember not just Cooper Rafe, but the fact that I saw a movie. All right, so I'm gonna start the review a little differently. Here we go. Four, six, 69. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. You know I watch a movie every day. Watch Cha Cha Real Smooth because my friend Jacqueline told me to watch it. I didn't know one thing about the movie. I never even heard the lyric Cha Cha Real Smooth. I didn't realize it was from the Cha Cha Slide. Yada, yada, yada. I watched the movie. Dakota Johnson plays the mother of a autistic child, played beautifully by an actress whose name escapes me. Cooper Rafe is a 22 year old boy who has finished college and has no idea what he wants. And the movie starts, this movie grabs you from the first minute because this movie was me. I had a habit when I was young, maybe the habit has not left me, where, talk about getting personal, but where I would have crushes on people, on older women. And whether it was sometimes people I knew, sometimes people I saw, sometimes it was friends of my parents, sometimes it was the older girls, like when I was in seventh grade, I had crushes on seniors in high school. And uh, this movie opens with a kid at a bar mitzvah falling in love with one of the dancers, with one of the party starters, and declaring to his mom, played by Leslie Mann, Judd Aptow's wife, from 40-year-old virgin and the sister and knocked up, you know Leslie, man, declaring his love. But instead of just sitting on it, Potsy, he goes up to the party starter and declares his love, which is exactly what I used to do. I would never just let my crushes just not know I had a crush because for me and my ego, I was Jim Carrey before there was Jim Carrey. I always thought I had a chance, always. One in a million, those odds work for me. So invariably he gets turned down and it impacts the rest of his life. You see him then 10 years later and he's trying to find himself after college, can't ha find a real job, can't make money, lives at home with his mother and now divorced mother who's married to another guy, played by Brad Garrett, who I hadn't seen in a movie in a long time. Meets this mother at a bar mitzvah where he is attending, played by Dakota Johnson, and they strike up a friendship. Is it just a friendship? Is Cooper Rafe, his character, is he gonna get saved? Is it possible that he wants to just be the big brother? Does he wanna marry the older woman? Does he wanna break up a family? 
Is he lost? Can he be found? The script of Cha Cha Real Smooth is the best I've seen this year. Cooper Rafe, as a 25 year old producer, writer, director, is brilliant. The casting of Dakota Johnson, who is trying to forge a post 50 Shades career and is doing a great job of it. Go see her in The Lost Daughter if you haven't. She is showing up in really good movies. I don't know how to suggest any further cha-cha real smooth, given the fact that this is the second outing for Cooper Rafe. He had a movie called Shithouse, which we reviewed on November 11th, 2020. Another movie that I liked. <laughs> I can't, Coca. I can't trick people into thinking that. I plan on watching Shithouse today. <laughs> That's it. Cha-cha real smooth. You're going to be happy. It's on Apple. It's worth the subscription. If you don't have Apple TV Plus yet, what are you doing? It's better than cable. There's a ton of shows and a ton of great original movies on Apple. This is amongst the best movies of the year. Speaking of crushes, when a crush dies, it's impactful. The first crush I had that ever died, her name was Allie Gertz. I went to high school with Allie Gertz, and she died of AIDS in the uh, early 90s. She contracted at Studio 54 in the 80s. If you've never heard of Allie Gertz, you should Google her. There was a movie made about her life. We went to high school together, and I always got to hang out with her because I was cute, and she was, I was completely, completely non-threatening as opposed to the other boys in high school who were all trying to get with Allie Gertz. I thought my best play was the ducky route. And uh, when she died... She and Karen Rosen. Karen Rosen, if you're out there, you have no idea how upset I was that you dated Eric Freund. I thought it was going to be me. So when Allie Gertz died, it impacted me. And since that time, there have been women who have passed away who I had mad crushes on. And it gets me thinking that either those crushes got resolved or they didn't. Olivia Newton-John passed away yesterday. That is a unresolved crush. I never got to meet her. She died way too young at 73. She is a pop legend. If you have not seen Sandy in black leather, then you just don't get it. Olivia Newton-John, her voice matched her beauty and it matched her skill. You will be missed. Thank you, Olivia. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things we do here, we do, sometimes we restart a show, I make mistakes, we do a full show, you know that, and we go straight through. I like it when you give me corrections. I'm not going to get everything right. I have no script. I have no prompter. I have a rundown of topics to talk about. Coke and I discussed the show the day before, the day of, after, so all of that is happening, but I still make mistakes. Make sure you get to me with corrections because I'm going to make them. We talked about Pete Rose yesterday, and immediately the show had been out for like five minutes, and I got the correction. I had said that Pete Rose, when he appeared with the 1980 championship team in Philadelphia recently, that that was his first time on the field since his suspension by Bart Giamatti. I was wrong. Pete Rose was on the field post-suspension when Cincinnati hosted the All-Star Game in 2015. So it was not his first time on the field. Thank you for the correction. All right. When you have a player who stinks, how do you deal with that? When he's a franchise player, a big free agent signing, player who helped you win a World Series, but the player just can't play. Do you just release him? Do you let him go? Do you designate him for assignment? Do you talk to him first? What's the right procedure? The Chicago Cubs yesterday went public through their president of baseball operations, Jed Hoyer, and announced that Jason Hayward would not be returning to the Chicago Cubs for the eighth and final year of his eight-year, $184 million contract. As a Cubs fan, and there are a lot of you out there, how do you value Jason Hayward in your history? As a reminder, Jason Hayward was signed in 2015. His first season was 2016. He had been on the Cardinals. He was a huge free agent signing at the time. 
20 million bucks a year, significant at that time. Then the Cubs won the World Series in 2016. The curse was broken. The curse of the Billy Goat, the curse of Bartman, which was not really a curse. They just lost to a better team. All of the different things that happened over the years with the Cubs disappeared with Rizzo and Bryant and Hayward and Baez. A dynasty was being born. Theo Epstein was your president. Things were good. The Cubs never won another World Series after 16. The Cubs are the Nationals. The Nationals don't have a dynasty. They won in 19. The Marlins won in 03. I guess they won in 97 too. So two in six years, but two different teams. The dynasties that we've been around for, the Yankees with their core four, the Giants with Baumgartner and Posey when you win three, the Red Sox with their multiple championships. That's it. The Yankees World Series in 09, that was nice. Not a dynasty. Astros won it in 17. Garbage cans be, be damned. They haven't won it again. Can't be a dynasty and win one World Series. Are the Buffalo Bills a dynasty for getting to the Super Bowl four years in a row and losing? Some of you may be too young to remember this. The Buffalo Bills went to the Super Bowl four years in a row. It's like going to the World Series four years in a row and losing all four times. Is that a dynasty? The Atlanta Braves won their division for like 15 straight years and won one World Series in 1998, was it, Coca? No, that was the Yankees. 1996. Maybe it was 95. I think the Yankees won in 96. I think they won it in 95. The year after the World Series was canceled in 94. Anyway, that's a great seg segment on a previous show. Would you rather have your team make the playoffs every year but win one ring or have your team make the playoffs two years out of 20 but win two rings? The other years, they stink. We always want the rings. No, but you got to get the chance at winning the rings. So the Cubs win one World Series with Jason Hayward. And then that's it. Rizzo's gone. Bryant's gone. Baez is gone. They kept Contreras and Hap. God knows why. But Jason Hayward, who's out with a bad knee, gets told, we're not bringing you back next year. That is very rare. What we would do is speak to the player and we would designate that player. If it's a player who's a veteran, a player who's been around, you are going to communicate with that player. If it's a young player you're designating off the roster because you need space, you just call them into the office and say you've been designated. It's in the past tense. When it's a veteran or someone who's been a part of your organization, a meaningful part of your organization, you bring that player into the manager's office and you say, we are going to, we are about to designate you. If that player is not injured, I'd be concerned about that strategy because if that player then claims injury, that player has to go on the injured list and would continue to get paid. But when you've got a player who's overpaid and injured, there is no danger in letting the player know what you're doing before it happens because the player cannot take advantage of anything. The player's already on the injured list, getting service time and getting paid is majorly great. He's overpaid, so by releasing him, no one's going to pick him up. In baseball, when you try to get a released player, you can get him, but you got to pay him his actual salary, which is why players make it through waivers. Then they sign with the team, and the new team gets to pay him the minimum, and the old team has to pay the balance. Albert Pujols is being paid by the Angels last year, not the Dodgers. Justin Upton, Angels. So the point is, Jason Hayward is not nearly good enough to play for another team at his salary. So I want you to ponder this as we get to our pick of the day. Are you upset with that signing that was celebrated in 2015? Or does winning that one World Series make the Jason Hayward signing worthwhile? My view, they got the ring. Nothing personal pick of the day. The San Diego Padres are 1-5 since they got Juan Soto. Do you think they're happy? I think they're despondent beyond repair. They have not scored a run in 23 innings with supposedly the juggernaut offense with Juan Soto and Manny Machado and Will Myers and Josh Bell and Brandon Drury. Hip, hip, hooray. They had Blake Snell on the mound. He lost one nothing to the Giants yesterday. We are 80-66. and 66.
no bueno. Do you know the Padres are only a game ahead of the Brewers? If the Brewers catch the Padres, the Padres will miss the playoffs entirely. And we are now getting toward the middle of August. Can you imagine? Does A.J. Preller get fired if the Padres miss the playoffs? He should get fired anyway, but can you imagine? All right, my pick today. When you fire a manager midseason, you're hoping for the Jack McKeon. The Jack McKeon is the famous step in baseball. When you do a midseason firing and your team goes on to win the World Series. That's what we did in 03. Fire Jeff Torborg, bring in Jack McKeon, win the World Series. It's called doing the Jack McKeon. Everybody who fires their manager during the season is trying to do the Jack McKeon. The Phillies fire Girardi. Yeah. Trying to do the McKeon. Rob Thompson is heading that way. He may win manager of the year. That's how well the Phillies have played since they got rid of Girardi. That's how badly Girardi needed to be gotten rid of in Philadelphia. The Phillies have Zach Wheeler going tonight against the Marlins. Can you imagine Girardi having to publicly say that he's rooting for the Phillies and how he's so happy for his guys and wants them to succeed when we know the truth, that he roots for them to lose every single game? Every game. Phillies over the Marlins. We'll be back tomorrow with a far better movie review of Shithouse. Cannot believe that. Coco, you keeping that in the show? It's just business. This is nothing personal. 